So today I'm going to talk about um, stories every developer should know. Uh, this came about because Mark Richards and I, uh, Mark is a well-known software architect, and uh, we do these uh, workshops and training classes for software architecture fundamentals where we're talking to brand new software architects. And all these stories keep coming up because we keep saying, well, the reason we have elastic scale is because of pets.com. And you know about pets.com, right? And nobody knows about pets.com. And so that's one of the interesting things about our field is that so many interesting things are constantly coming at you from the future that you often ignore really important things that happened in the past, but sometimes those lessons are really important. And that's mostly what this talk is about. Uh, and there's something about stories that is much more evocative than just plain facts. You can tell people facts about something, but if you tell a really good story with a good punchline, you can move people a lot more because we're used to hearing stories ever since you were a little baby. You heard stories uh, with a, you know, a beginning, a middle, and the end. And so uh, sometimes this helps convey messages better than uh, just facts. And a lot of these stories end up coming from the realm of forensic engineering, uh, which is basically a field of engineering that looks at things that break spectacularly and why. And I got really fascinated with this kind of engineering for a little while before I realized that only a few people get to do this, uh, but a lot of these are sort of forensic engineering uh, from software, but some of these are not software projects at all. And in fact, the first one I wanna talk about is one of the two field trips that I encourage developers and architects to take. And when I give this talk in the US, it's a much bigger ask. It's a much closer trip for you folks. So I start and end my talk with a field trip. And the first field trip here is for the Vasa. And this is my oldest story as well. Uh, this comes from the 1600s when uh, Sweden was at war with Poland and Lithuania at the time. And the king of Sweden decided he was finished with this war, so he wanted to finish this war by building the most ultimate ship that had ever been created up until that time. That was the Vasa. This was a magnificent warship that up until that time, ships were either gunships or were their troop transport. The Vasa was gonna be both. Up until that time, they had a certain size gun. The Vasa was gonna have twice that size guns. It was gonna be twice of everything. This is actually a picture of the Vasa. As I mentioned, this is a field trip. And you can actually go see the Vasa uh, for reasons I'll talk about in just a second. Part of the problem, though, is they never actually built a ship that was both a troop transport and a gunship with double the size guns that they had uh, ever put on a ship before. And while they had the best shipbuilders in the world, they were really pushing the envelope on this design. And what happened was when they got the ship finished, they rolled it out into the harbor in a great celebration and did a gun salute off one side of the ship. And because it was top heavy, it caused it to tip over and capsize and sink to the bottom of the bay there in Sweden. Turns out Swedish water is very cold and very anaerobic. And so it preserved the Vasa until the 1920s when they resurrected it and put it in a, a museum now in Stockholm. So you can go visit the Vasa now and actually see this great example of requirements gone wrong. Because that's basically what the Vasa is, is this project where they just kept adding requirements and kept adding requirements. And then you eventually launch the thing and it sinks to the bottom of an ocean somewhere. Because they had built two deck ships before, and they had built cannon ships before, but they'd never really built a two-deck cannon ship troop transport kind of ship before. And so this is a classic example of trying to scale some sort of architecture past where it naturally wants to go. But this is a really common pattern that we see over and over in software. And this is the best metaphor I've seen of this pattern that we keep seeing over and over. We start with something simple and beautiful and elegant that solves a problem, and it's like, okay, that's nice. But you know scissors, every once in a while you need scissors, but now we're good, we're done. It's beautiful, it does exactly what we want. But you know corkscrew, every once in a while you need a corkscrew, but now we're really done. We're, we're finished, we're done. it's good now, it does everything we need, it's a little complicated, but that's okay, because it's solving some problems. But you know push pin. Every once in a while, you just really need, but now we're really, we're done, we're good. We're sure it's finished now. Every one of these things always ends up with this. 
We keep seeing this pattern over and over in software where we keep building things. We start with something simple and beautiful and elegant and we keep adding stuff to it to make it useful to solve real problems. And it gets to a point where everybody says, ah, that's too complicated, let's burn it all down and start over from scratch. And we've seen this cycle several times. We're currently in the cycle right now where we're burning everything down and rewriting everything in JavaScript. Uh, Atwood's Law, uh, Jeff Atwood's a famous pundit in the software world, uh, he has codified Atwood's Law, which I'm terrified is coming true, that everything that can be written in JavaScript will be written in JavaScript. And I don't know if that's the best thing or not, but that's exactly what we're seeing, the cycle over and over again. I fully expect in probably another two years, people are going to look at JavaScript and go, this thing has gotten too bloated and enterprisey. We need to burn this thing down and start over from scratch with something else. Who knows what that'll be this time. But all, fundamentally what this is about is misunderstanding these trade-offs that are at the heart of everything, of course, in software. And it turns out in things not software as well. My second story is another engineering project, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This was in Washington State at the Kitsap Peninsula. And this is a bridge that opened traffic on July 1st, 1940, and then closed to traffic on November 7th of that very same year. This is a picture of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge. This was a particular bridge design that was popular at the time. We had a, a thin metal deck supported by cables. This is a more modern design, but it's the same kind of bridge, just like the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, with a thin deck supported by cables. And the reason they don't build bridges like that much anymore is because of the Tacoma Narrows Bridge, because it turns out that in this gorge, when the wind blew at a particular frequency, it would cause a resonance with this deck and it caused it to pitch like this. Now, the people who lived here in 1940 thought this was the coolest thing ever. It was like a ride at a source. See this guy walking in the middle here, riding this thing like it was a carnival ride or something like that? You wouldn't get me within a mile of this thing. There's a car on it pitching back and forth wildly in the wind. And the reason it closed eight months after it opened was because one day the wind pitched up exactly right and it caused the thing to eventually collapse into that river gorge. This is the thing that basically convinced them to stop building bridges like that because what happened was they kept pushing the envelope on this design. It's like, well, you know, that design worked well. Can we make the plates a little thinner on this one and a little thinner and a little thinner? And it turns out mostly you can until you find a river gorge that has a certain frequency of wind that starts at resonance frequency and then you get a disaster like this. This is another example of trying to scale architecture in a particular way, but this is taking a proven concept and pushing it until you find an interesting boundary condition. And a lot of times our mathematics don't handle these boundary conditions that we've never encountered before well. This is one of those cases. It turns out contemporaneously, uh, there was another bridge designer in Sweden, again, coincidentally, named Robert Majort. And he was designing bridges with this revolutionary new material called reinforced concrete and using arches. And of course, arches is a proven way to design a supporting structures. At the time, the math couldn't say whether these bridges were safe or not, uh, but he forged ahead and actually built and designed a lot of these bridges. And of course, now we have math that shows that these are quite safe. He also designed these, these pillars that uh, distribute weight better and crack less than other kinds of columns in the buildings. And the way he was designing these things is not necessarily with mathematical design. He started with mathematical design and he was pushing the envelope, but he was constantly verifying. He was great at testing things. He would build scale models and test them under realistic load conditions and constantly iterate on those designs. And that's why he was able to innovate in bridge design without hitting those boundary conditions because he's always testing uh, to make sure that the things he was designing worked the way he thought they did. My next story is the F-16 fighter jet. Back in 1973, 1974, the Air Force went to Northrop Grumman and said, we need a Mach 2.5 aircraft. So they started trying to design a Mach 2.5 aircraft, which was really difficult at the time because if it was light enough to go Mach 2.5, it would vibrate apart and other bad things would happen. So they tried and tried and tried and they eventually went back to the Air Force and said, okay, why does it need to be Mach 2.5? The Air Force said, well, these things are expensive, and so if it gets into a dogfight, we want it to be able to get away in a hurry if it needs to. 
So now understanding the actual requirements, they went back and designed the F-16 Tomcat, which was a Mach 2 aircraft, but it was the most maneuverable aircraft they'd ever designed, and it could accelerate really fast if it needed to. And this is a great example of one of the things that we constantly have to do, particularly as software architects, because people keep bringing us solutions rather than problems. And it's very often your job to be the annoying three-year-old and say, well, but why do you need that? But why do you need that? But why do you, oh, that's what you really need. Okay, now I see what the real crunchy center of your problem is, and now I can actually come up with a solution that's very often than the solution that's been handed you. Like, we need a Mach 2.5 aircraft. Uh, okay, from an engineering standpoint, that's not really possible, but why? Why does it need to be that? And when you get to the root cause, you can actually address that. As architects in particular, we deal with a lot of these illities in software. Software really consists of requirements plus all these other things like performance and scalability and security, etc. But there's one of these illities that I think is really important that we need to pay more attention to as developers and architects, and that's feasibility. Should we even be doing this thing or not? Because what happens a lot of times is you're presented with a problem that you suspect may be not possible, but you think, well, you know, if we work really hard and, you know, work a little bit of overtime, and, you know, if nothing unexpected comes up on this project, because when has that ever happened on a software project where something we didn't anticipate come up? You know, that just never happens on software projects, so we can safely discount that as a possibility on the software project. Uh, then maybe if all those things come true, we can get it done, but you know that's not going to happen. Lots of things are going to come up, and a lot of times you end up having to ask why. This is more important now than it was 10 years ago, because if you look at the roles that people had before the continuous delivery and DevOps revolution, architects and developers were very siloed off in the engineering world, and you had another silo with DBAs and another silo with operations. But modern architectures like microservices has forced a lot of these barriers to go away, at least get softer, because now when you look at things like microservices, you have to include things like relational database design, and a lot of the superpowers of that architecture come from interactions with operations. And so while your political influence and money probably hasn't changed much, your perspective has changed a lot over the last few years and you actually have a much better idea now to see if something is in fact feasible. Should we be trying to do this or should we be trying to do something that's a lot simpler? The next thing I want to talk about is null. So null was invented. A lot of people think that this is just a natural part of the universe, but it wasn't. It was invented. And in fact, it was invented by this guy. So Sir Tony Hoare, who did a talk at InfoQ about a decade ago called Null References the Billion Dollar Mistake, because he figures that Null's, the design of Null has probably cost the industry about a billion dollars in counting, and he asked that you please don't write him a bill for that, because he's saying that he's sorry for doing that. So where did this thing come about? How did this come into our lives? Well, if you go to the O'Reilly website, you can download this brief history of computer programming languages, which only accounts for a few of them. So let's zoom in on a particular era here and look at the origins of something like Java. Now, of course, Java started its life as this thing called Oak, and you can see Oak there in uh, oh, my pointer's not, oh, there we go. In uh, June 1991, that was the origins of Java. If you look at the progenitor languages that lead into that, like ANSI C, this blue line here is C++. Uh, this red line there is, uh, so let's go backwards in time a little bit. This language called Cedar, which came from, there's a Pascal up there, there's that purple line, and that led to Modula 2, which eventually led to Objective-C in Java. But if we keep going back to the things that, see this purple line right here that inspired Pascal? If we keep going back and back and back, what you'll end up with is Algol 60. And that's the language that Sir Tony designed way back in 1960. And that's the language that introduced the idea of null into our lexicon as software developers. So back at that time, there was no such thing as open source, uh, and, and there were lots of different computer makers. He worked for a computer maker named Elliot that was based here in the UK. And the way the computer makers worked was they built a piece of hardware, proprietary hardware, and then they would build a proprietary operating system for it and a language that optimized for their hardware. And then they'd sell you the solution as a, uh, a package. 
This is some of Algol 60, the, the language he designed. So you can see this is the beginning of the structured programming revolution. You can see the origins of Pascal in this, because this is one of the progenitors and inspirations for Pascal. And one of the things that he thought about a lot when he designed this language was, should he build protections into this language? Because a really common thing at that time was to cheat on things like array subscripts and read past arrays and actually store stuff you know, before the beginning of arrays and cheat and do things like that. And he thought about adding protections in his language, including null pointer checks in the language. And he created a version of Algol 60 that had null pointer checks in it, just like we have in Java and uh, the .NET world now. And he built a switch where you could turn these checks on or off if you wanted to. And then he sent out a survey to all the people who were buying the Elliott computer and said, hey, would you like a much safer programming language for your computer? And the overwhelming answer was no. For two reasons. The first reason was it slowed things down noticeably in that era. We're, not, we're talking about very primitive software. And of course, if you're adding null checks and that kind of stuff, it would make a noticeable performance difference. But that wasn't really the main reason they all said no. The main reason they all said no was because of the way the world worked that time, if you built a new computer, an Elliott computer that was running Algol 60, you can't convince the entire world to write everything in Algol 60 right away. And so one of the things that has to be is backwards compatible to what's common at the time and have a cross compiler to compile into your language so that you can support all the code that's already out there. And the code that was most dominant at the time was Fortran. And in Fortran, every single sleazy trick in the book was considered standard when you wrote Fortran code about cheating on array subscripts and storing things before the beginning of arrays and after the end of arrays. And it turns out that if you added those safety checks into Algol, it would compile none of the legacy Fortran code. I mean, zero of it. And so it, was, it made the, com the computer essentially pointless to try to sell because we can have all these safety checks. And oh, by the way, it's not applicable to all the code that you currently have, which is not a great sales uh, uh, pitch to make. If you go back to this languages chart, see the language that comes down from the top and meets with Algol 58? If you go all the way back up there, there's our friend Fortran, the first language. And this explains why we can't have nice things. Because we're constantly trying to be backwards compatible to the past, all the way back to the first language. When you get a null pointer exception now in Java or .NET, it's because those languages are trying to be backwards compatible to Java and C family languages, which are trying to be backwards compatible to Algol, and that C family, which is trying to be backwards compatible to the first language, which is Fortran. We can never get away from all the legacy stuff that's laying around. Uh, this is one of the great frustrations in software is you never really get to start greenfield. There's always some legacy stuff that you have to deal with. And of course, the thing he was trying to trade off there is safety versus speed uh, and protection and, and obviously uh, speed and protection lost out. This is true in virtually every language that you see. So what is the lurking crazy legacy thing that's in Java right now? If you ever get a chance to meet Brian Getz, who's the uh, designer, basically, of the, uh, the Java language right now, and you ever want to see the red vein stick out in his forehead, just bring up the topic of serialization. Because when Java was designed, it was assumed that every application going forward was going to be a three-tier distributed application, because that was all the rage at the time. And so one of the design criteria in Java, let's build serialization into the core of the language. Every single thing you can put on the wire and get it back uh, off the wire. And now fast forward 20 years, Brian Getz is trying to figure out how to serialize a lambda, which makes no sense whatsoever. Because there are a lot of things that just don't make sense to do that, but that legacy they've been carrying. In fact, there's a huge conversation that get, just got kicked off in the Java ecosystem. What happens if we kill serialization? And it's a big deal because Brian works at Oracle, and his number one mandate at Oracle is don't break Java. His number two is to make Java cool, but number one is don't break Java. 
And so now he's got to tread this very fine line. In fact, the design of Lambdas is quite brilliant because it was completely backwards compatible to all the stuff that came before but still worked, but that becomes increasingly difficult as time goes on. But it's really hard to judge the long-term implications of some decisions like this. Another great example of that is Ada. Now this is not Lady Ada Lovelace, who is generally regarded as the first programmer in history. This was the woman who had write some, wrote some code for Charles Babbage's uh, difference engine, and turns out it would have worked if they'd had the money to actually build that steam-powered computer. But her name was used as a language that was designed uh, in the U.S. back in the 1980s. Because in 1975, the Department of Defense in the U.S. noticed an, a, a creeping problem that was coming up. Remember the Elliott computers I was talking about earlier? Well, they had a whole bunch of solutions like that. And the problem was, if you're Elliott computer and you're not successful, you go out of business. And that means that there's no support for your hardware, your software. There was no such thing as open support source at the time. And so they kept finding themselves on dead-end platforms, embedded systems, and a bunch of other bad things. And they also realized they had written the code to translate from uh, XY to polar coordinates in every single language on Earth. And that gets less and less valuable every language you have to translate that to because they're having to write everything in so many different languages. And so they put together this high order language working group to try to figure out is there a single language we could standardize on organization wide to solve all these problems. And they looked around and couldn't find one. And so they did what all government organizations did. They put together a committee to design a brand new programming language. And that language is called ADA. This language fell in the weird little crack here between, in the early to mid-70s, was a structured programming revolution with Pascal and C. And then there was a brief time of about three or four years where modular programming languages became really popular. Modula was one of those, and Ada was one of those. And then object-oriented languages came along and swept them all away. And that was C++, and Object Pascal, et cetera. And Ada fell into that modular programming language era, right before objects really became popular. Ada was a very readable language, a very Pascal-like, and so here's some actual Ada code that I wrote a long time ago. A lot of this code is still around. In fact, uh, the avionics on a lot of aircrafts written in Ada, the 777 avionics code is written in Ada because it's deterministic. It's really good for multi-threaded real-time systems. That's part of the reason it was designed. Um, and it turned out this was a great thing for the DOD because in 1983 they were supporting more than 450 languages. And by 1996 it was down to 37. Almost everything was written in ADA with a few exemptions for very specialized cases, but this turned out to be a really good thing for them. But then in the early 2000s they started moving away from ADA. And in fact they've stopped standardizing on ADA now for a couple of reasons. One is the rise of commercial off-the-shelf software and the idea of open source and the ability to take on something once it has ended life. Back in the 70s, that was not common at all. If a company went out of business, they just took all their toys and went home. But now it's more common for things to last. It's common for things to be based on common operating systems like Linux, and then they open source things when companies go away. They can work out deals now to get that code. But the main reason they ended up moving away from the ADA strategy was the ultimate problem that some companies find themselves in, which is if you build everything, then you own everything. I did some work for a, consulting, or for a finance company uh, in, uh, outside of New York, and they were very, very paranoid about uh, open source and any of their source code getting out of their company. And so paranoid, in fact, that they had taken the USB slots on the desktop computers and filled them in with super glue so that nobody could plug in a USB drive. So we were actually there to do a code review and assessment, and it took over a week for them to get us a copy of their code in a way that we could read it because everything was locked down. All the CD writers were turned off, all the USB. So one of the, the, the managers literally went home and broke the rules of the company and burned it onto a CD-ROM for us so that we could actually read the code of this organization. And they were so paranoid about using open source that they had built their own uh, application server. They built their own web framework that was sort of like Struts, but not really. 
Uh, they built their own Corba orb. They built their own. At one point, I said, did you build your own operating system? And they said, no, we're using one of those from somewhere else. And I said, why not? You built everything else from scratch. The reason we were there consulting with them, and I'm not kidding, they were thinking about building their own IDE. And we told them, okay, stop. You got to just stop now. Because you can download Eclipse. You know, you can, it takes like 15 minutes to download it. You're talking man decades worth of effort to create something like this. 15 minutes versus, you know, it's. But the fundamental problem they were running into, and a lot of people run into this problem, is that you're on the cutting edge of something like, uh, for example, those guys, because they both there built their terrible version of struts before struts came out. So they had their own craptaculous version of struts, and then struts came out. And it was 20% different from their version. So now you have to make the decision. Do we stay with our own internal craptaculous version of this or just switch over to the open source one? And they always decided, let's keep with our internal version. Well, now fast forward 10 years, the best developers in the organization are doing nothing but full-time maintenance mode on your own internal broken, crappy code. Because your code's nowhere nearly as good as the struts code because there are literally thousands of people working on that and you've got two people working as hard as they can in the basement of your organization trying to keep up with the rest of the world. And that's exactly what the DOD discovered is that, okay, well, now the Army needs to be able to support things like TCP IP. That means we have to build TCP IP in ADA. It's like, oh man, really? Can't we just download that somewhere and get on with it? I worked for a company that was, had a bunch of mainframe stuff, and we said, yeah, we really want to do SOAP. This is when SOAP was really popular. We need to make SOAP calls in the mainframe. They said, okay, the estimate is it'll take nine months to support that. We're like, nine months? And they said, yeah, we, we've got to write TCP IP for the mainframe. It's like, great. Uh, so let's reinvent everything. But this is the problem that you run into with standardization. Standardization is obviously good, but once you get to a certain point, it becomes one of those trade-offs that shifts to something bad, and it's really hard to tell exactly when that happens. So the next one is the Ariane 5. This is a commercial rocket that takes satellites up into space. And this was in 1996, the 4th of June in 1996. And this is one of their launches. And you'll see that this launch actually goes tragically bad at 39 seconds. And this is an unmanned spacecraft that lost millions of dollars worth of satellite equipment, but no one was harmed during this. You'll see that 39 seconds into this launch, the rocket veers violently off to one side, and that causes an internal self-destruct mechanism to trigger because if it ever goes off course enough, it is automatically self-destruct. And that's what we're about to see happen. There's the veer, and there's the automatic self-destruct, which destroyed this rocket. And of course, after this happened, they did a forensic analysis as to, okay, why did this happen? And they learned exactly why it happened. So this was the Ariane 5. Anyone want to guess what came before the Ariane 5? It's not a hard question. <laughs> the Ariane 4, exactly. And when they designed the Ariane 5, they said, well, you know, one of the things we're going to need for the Ariane 5 is a guidance system. Somebody said, oh, no problem. We've already got one of those. We had one for the Ariane 4. All right, check. Good. We're good on the guidance system part. So we're good to go. The only problem was the guidance system in the Ariane 4 was 16-bit, and the flight data recorder on the Ariane 5 was 64-bit. It turns out that 39 seconds into that flight on 1996, the flight data recorder crammed a 64-bit number into the guidance system that was 16-bit. It turns out some of those bits might have been important. And that's exactly what caused the, the rocket to crash, is this overflow error when they tried to cram too much data. It got a crazy invalid reading. That's what caused the flight correction, which caused the auto-destruct. And so the obvious problem here is the guidance system is 16-bit because the version 5 is faster than version 4, and they're trying to reuse this code because, you know, code reuse is such a benefit in, on so many projects. Here's the really frustrating thing about this particular thing. It turns out that they actually had two different guidance systems in the Ariane 5. And the old one for the Ariane 4 was only used on the ground. 
to tell where the rocket was, where they were doing all the moving around and all that sort of stuff. The problem was, though, that when they first put it in the rocket, it would crash a lot because it was buggy. And it took a really long time to restart that guidance code. And so they just put a hack in it that said, well, just keep that guidance code for the ground running for the first 40 seconds of flight and then have it automatically cut off so we won't have to incur that reboot cost every time we're, as we're testing it on the ground. And of course, they forgot that code was in there. And 39 seconds in flight, the flight data recorder crammed this number into this ground-based guidance system that was never expecting that. And so basically what these guys were doing is debugging in production. And it caused them to lose millions of dollars worth of satellite equipment uh, because of this forced 40 seconds of flight thing. So this is a combination of several cascading problems, debugging in production, using too much legacy stuff. But another problem that I refer to as abstraction distraction. And this uh, it attacks us all the time and it's getting worse and worse. Here's what I mean by that. If you look at common technology stack from like 2005, you could change the names on the boxes, but the general topology was basically that. If you look at a similar lines and boxes view in 2016 or 2019, it's way more complicated, with way more moving parts and way more abstractions. And that's the problem we run into as developers because all these things are based on abstractions which work almost all the time, almost all the time. But that's the problem. You trust these things to work all the time and you get really surprised and annoyed when they don't work. And what happens is some weird little problem will occur at the bottom of this abstraction stack and then bubble all the way up to the front and then this thing pops up in your face with a 10,000 line stack trace and it's like, where did you come from? And what primordial swamp am I going to, have to crawl into to kill you to figure out how to get back to what I was doing before? The classic example of this is something we fortunately don't see much anymore, which was this. Because you'd be working along in your files and folders and nested hierarchy and all that, and then you see this, and your first thought is, how much have I lost? Because all those abstractions just went away. And now you're back down to zeros and ones on a metal spinning rust disk and trying to figure out how to put those things back together again. This is a problem as we keep building more and more sophisticated software, we keep building those on abstractions that almost always work. But then when they don't, it becomes more and more difficult over time uh, to debug those things. Um, and of course, this can never be a problem because, you know, you can always safely assume that an int is always exactly the same size across all platforms ever. Because who has ever gotten in trouble uh, making that assumption? My next one is about the one I brought up before, pets.com. These two are actually sort of in a pair because they have the opposite problem. So there's probably no chance any of you here remember pets.com. Even people in the U.S. who are alive in this period don't remember the name, but some people remember this. This is from 1999. This was the mascot for pets.com. So 1999, this is when Amazon was just getting started. And pets.com came out and they were going to be this massive online superstore for pet supplies. And they had this massive marketing campaign with a sock puppet and it worked. This thing was everywhere on TV and the, the big football game ads and all that stuff. And they became super, super uh, popular. The problem was they spent a lot of money on their marketing campaign, not so much money on their infrastructure. And back in 1999, Elastic Scale wasn't a configuration setting on your cloud provider. Because none of those things existed. If you really wanted a scalable solution, you had to buy hardware. And you had to buy a lot of hardware, uh, pretty expensive hardware. And it turns out these guys did not. And their marketing campaign was great. And so it, something happened that nobody really thought was possible, that they were so successful that it destroyed them. And you know, in the real world, it's hard for enough people to show up at your brick and mortar store to actually reduce it to rubble because the laws of physics kind of prevent that from happening, you know, the size of doorways and that kind of thing. But on the internet, that's not true. You can have enough people show up at your site to completely destroy it. And that's exactly what happened to these guys. But here's the fundamental problem they ran into. 
you build an architecture that looks like this, and then your web server gets slammed. So what do you do? They add more web servers. Then your app server gets slammed. So what do you do? You add more app servers. Then your database server gets slammed. So what do you do? You know the answer to this. You add more database servers. And then they get slammed. So what do you do? Uh-oh. We've run out of places to add stuff. This is exactly the problem Amazon ran into as well, is that we have ran out of places to uh, add more stuff uh, to our infrastructure now. This actually kicked off an architecture that was popular in the late 90s and early 2000s, which is very contemporaneous with pets.com, called the space-based architecture. This was a, based on this mathematical theory called tuple space. And the idea of a space-based architecture was you could build this architecture that could withstand incredible levels of scale by splitting these things out and uh, basically consolidating all those results back together, eventual consistency style. These things turned into, um, big giant caches. So coherence started its life as one of these things and became what we know as coherence now. Hazelcast is an example of one of these big giant distributed caches, but it's a way of handling this kind of elastic scale before we had you know, a cloud providers where it's a configuration setting to get elasticity. So pets.com way under invested in infrastructure. Webvan way over invested in infrastructure. This is a grocery delivery service in the US that spawned in the early 2000s, and they built these enormous warehouses everywhere. They didn't rely on existing grocery stores. They built their own infrastructure everywhere, and they also had a really bad plan for scaling because they started on the west coast of the US and then tried to move to the middle of the country and then the south, and then the dead middle. You know, if you're moving perishable things around, maybe you want to keep things close together, not as far apart as possible. And so they had the problem of way too much infrastructure before they could support the kind of scale that they needed. My next story is a cautionary tale about lazy engineering. This is the story of Knight Capital. If you ever want to find a good reference to this story, just Google the phrase bankrupt in 45 minutes, and you'll find the story the Knight Capital. This is a, a great example of cascading indiscipline causing problems in software projects. So Knight Capital is a commodities trading firm in the U.S. and there's a, uh, the SEC in the U.S. releases guidelines for al algorithmic trading, these formats that you're supposed to follow for al algorithmic trading. A new one was coming out that was going to go into effect in 2012 called SMARS, and it's an acronym for something that I don't remember. They had implemented several of these algorithm trading uh, schemes before, uh, and there was an old one in their code base called PowerPeg that was still in their code base from years ago underneath a feature toggle that had just been left off for all those years. So this is strike one, never leave old feature toggles lay laying around in your code base. But they did, and so one of the developers, who I will nominate as maybe the laziest developer that I know of, suggested that when they implement the new SMARS code, why don't we implement that underneath the old PowerPeg feature toggle? Because, you know, if we create a new SMARS feature toggle, we're going to have to figure out something to name the SMARS feature toggle. And how to, how, you know, naming is so hard in software. What could we call the SMARS feature toggle? I just don't know. Let's just reuse the PowerPeg when that seems like the safest thing to do. And so that's what they did. That's strike to never, ever reuse an old feature toggle. But they did. And then... They deployed the brand new code to seven of their eight servers. Now, I don't know what happened between seven and eight. Maybe their operations person got distracted by something shiny and it just never happened. But for whatever reason, this is the setup when they went live on August 1st, 2012. And when they went live, it turns out seven of the servers is doing power peg, uh, SMARS and one's doing PowerPeg. It turns out that SMARS is selling PowerPeg is buying. <laughs> and they looked at this and said, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be happening. That's bad. That's not supposed to be happening like that. What's causing that? It's got to be the new SMARS code. We screwed up something in the new SMARS code. Get that SMARS code off of all the servers. And so they hot undeployed the SMARS code from all the servers, but left the PowerPeg feature toggle turned on, and so now they're all doing PowerPeg. At about 45 minutes, they pull the plugs out of the wall on the servers to make it stop and had a venture capital firm write them a check for a little over $400 million to keep them solvent. 
because that's how much they had racked up in sales that they couldn't support over that period of time. This is a great example of uh, really lazy engineering practices, but it's a great example too of what I call bad variability. So variability on software projects requires effort. And this is a bad kind of variability because if all their machines had been exactly the same, this could never have happened. But allowing that variability to creep in allowed this to happen. And so this sort of begs the question, do you even know what DevOps means? And of course this led to, uh, this, it was called a DevOps cautionary tale. But it's also a good uh, advice to clean up some of that technical debt. My next one is really ultimately the motivation for doing this talk because every developer should know about the San Francisco project and not nearly enough people know about it. Back in the late 1990s, IBM looked around, said, you know what, we've seen a lot of business applications. They pretty much all look the same to us. So we're gonna build one last business application and it's gonna be called the San Francisco project. Because we've looked around and we've noticed every company seems to have this thing called general ledger. So we're going to build one last general ledger module that will accommodate every company on earth. And the idea is you just download the general ledger module and just tweak and tweak and tweak and tweak some properties and you know a few little custom code and tweaking it. And before long you've modeled your business exactly. That was the vision of the San Francisco project. And they released these design documents. Here's some of the design stuff here where there are these core business processes, general ledger, accounts payable, accounts receivable, warehouse management, order management, because every company has this stuff, right? So we'll just build one last version of all those things. And so for a while, this is the largest Java project on earth. They employed more Java developers than anybody else. And they actually released two modules of the San Francisco project before they realized this is the dumbest project anybody had ever tried to build, ever. Because they were trying to chase this idea of ultimate canonicality, the single source of truth, ultimate reuse across everything in their world. And it turns out it was a huge disaster. And so they started with the foundation utilities and these common business objects. In 1997 was the original design. You move forward into 2000. They decided at this point they've shipped some stuff and said, you know what? That was a bad idea because several people downloaded the first versions and said, okay, you're going to be the first people to use it. And they said, well, it's missing this and this and this and this and this and this. And it doesn't do this right. And it doesn't do this. And they're like, oh, wow, your business is really complicated. Whoever imagined that? How shocking. And so by this point, they decided that this is not going to work. And they're going to have to abandon this project. But they've written so much code. There's just so much code there. You can't just throw it away. I mean, you can't just throw it away. There's just so much. I mean, it just, you can't throw that much away. We've got to do something with it. So, but what do we do with it, with all that code? Well, it turned into something you may have heard of called EJB. That was all the San Francisco common business objects, all the crazy amount of indirection and interfaces and all that stuff in EJB, that all came from the original design of the San Francisco project. Lest you think this wasn't a big deal, there were books written about this, the San Francisco Component Framework and Introduction, which has one five-star review on Amazon, which I've got to think is the author's mother, because <laughs> it's hard to believe that this is the book that finally just lit somebody up. It's like, this is the book I've been waiting for. This is a big deal because you'll notice the forward of this one by Martin Fowler. So this is a big deal at the time when it was created. And I actually have one of these books and it was kind of interesting to look at the way they were trying to design this because if you're really trying to design something to last a long time, their design probably would not have lasted. But it's a great example of something that we see a lot in software. And we codified this in the evolutionary architecture book is what we call the last 10% rule. I used to work for a company many years ago that built applications in Microsoft Access, and we ended up shutting down that part of the business because we realized every Access project starts as a booming success and ends in total failure. And we wanted to understand the dynamic of why that kept happening over and over again, and we codified this as the last 10% rule. So if you look at what the user wants, if you use a tool like Access, about 80% of what they want is super fast and easy, and it's really amazing how fast you can get there. The next 10% of what they want is possible, but difficult. 
Because now you're trying to do something that the framework won't, doesn't quite want you to do, but you can kind of hack it and bend it and figure out a way around it. But that last 10% is impossible. And it turns out users always want 100% of what they want, and they're never satisfied with some random 90% less of that. And that's why every access project ended up in failure. How many of you in the room remember the fourth generation languages, the four GLs, that were all the rage in the 1990s? Some of you have enough gray hair to remember four GLs. Where are they now? They're all gone because they all suffer from this last 10% trap. What about something now that suffers from this? Right now, to me, all the serverless stuff looks exactly like this because it's a great way to prototype. Look how fast you can get stuff done. It's somebody else's computer. You don't even have to worry about it. And then you try to put it in production. It's like, oh, late to oh, startup to oh. And I've seen horrible hacks like, we'll build one Lambda to constantly ping this other one to keep it alive so I don't have the startup cost. That's a classic last 10% problem. Now, a lot of those platforms will eventually probably build out to full-blown platforms, but right now they still have very much this characteristic. And this is one of the problems you run into with every giant ERP package on Earth is they're trying to achieve this ultimate level of business reuse. So my next one, I mentioned earlier this problem of legacy. What if you had a project that at infinite time, no deadlines, infinite resources, it was literally funded by a billionaire who said, I don't care how much you spend, and I don't care how long you take, and there's no legacy you have to support. This sounds like fantasy land for most developers who are dealing with schedule pressure and legacy code and all that. There's infinite time, infinite resources, no legacy, and this project still failed utterly. This is written about in the book Dreaming in Code, which is a great book, uh, but I have to warn you, if you're a developer, it will give you trigger warnings. Because what this book is about, so uh, Mitch Kapoor was the, uh, one of the creators of Lotus 123, which is a famous piece of spreadsheet software, but Lotus also created the first personal information manager called Agenda which is a really powerful piece of software for considering the platform it was on. When he left Lotus, he decided to found a company to build a modern version of Agenda called Chandler, named after Raymond Chandler, the detective novelist. So he's a billionaire. So he hired rock star developers all over Silicon Valley and told them, here's the thing I want you to build. It's a desktop application, it's a PIM that does this automatic peer-to-peer -peer replication over the internet, it has all these morphable properties and all that stuff start working on it. And this, this journalist, Scott Rosenberg, thought, oh, this is cool. Here's an open source project that's funded by a billionaire. It'll be really interesting to write about this and see the dynamic of how software gets built. But he didn't actually see a lot of software get built. What he got to see is a lot of meetings about stuff. Because this was the big problem they had, was they all got together and said, well, you know, None of the existing database technologies is quite perfect. So we're going to design our own database. Because we have infinite time and money, and we want it to be exactly perfect. So they designed their own database. And then they had another meeting and said, yeah, you know, the database that we design, it's just not quite perfect. So they designed another database. And then they had another meeting about some stuff. They said, well, you know, that's not, it's almost good, but, you know, it's not quite exactly. And so they started designing another database. And at some point, the author, and so they're, they're trying to do six-month releases here, and they've missed the first six of them. They've released no software. We're years into this project now. And this writer's like, um, I'm trying to write a book about a software project. You guys think you're ever going to create a software project here? Or is this going to be another, oh no, it's another meeting. It's another, and so eventually the journalist is like, that's it, I'm out of here. And so the book ends before the project ends. Because the book basically ends and says, software project people are knuckleheads. And that's basically the summary of the book, is that these people don't know what in the world they're doing. They eventually limp to the finish line and ship this thing, and then shut down the entire Chandler project. It did about 1% of what the original vision was, did none of the magic stuff, and basically just shut the whole thing down. And basically they built all this stuff, but because they didn't have any kind of deadline pressure, nothing to keep them corralled, they were just building everything. And this brings up an important problem we see in software, which I describe as meta work is more interesting than work. The problem is, if you go to developers and they've written the same code, if you really want to describe to your grandparents what you do at work, a 
take things off web pages and put them in databases. And then I take things off databases and put them on web pages. Yeah, there's a bunch of details in between all that, but that's kind of how it works. And if you've done that for a bunch of projects, it gets kind of boring. You know what developers do when their day job gets boring? They invent cool puzzles to solve. So they'll have cool puzzles to work on when they come into work. This is meta work, it's more interesting than work. So the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, there's a crew that paints it. And it takes a year to paint the entire thing. And the water is so corrosive that once they get to the end, they just have to start over and paint some more. So they have a full-time job painting the Golden Gate Bridge. I was talking to one of our client developers recently, and he said, yeah, we're currently ripping out all the Angular stuff and replacing it with React. And I said, oh, is there a big business driver for that? And he said, no. <laughs> They're just painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Because, you know, when you go talk to the business people, <laughs> they keep asking for stuff. But, you know, here we're busy. Hey, no, sorry, we're busy. We'd like to do that, but we, we're busy. We're painting. We're, we're busy. Because, you know, when you get that done, you'll have the next thing you take some time for. So my last one is the other field trip in Barcelona, Sagrada Familia. This is the basilica that looks like it was designed by Dr. Seuss. This is the uh, magnificent Gaudi architecture. Inside it's supposed to look like a forest where all these pillars go up and meet and in, into these branches and trees. These are all pictures I took inside Sagrada Familia. It's an absolutely magnificent place inside with all these stained glass and all the lighting, etc. The interesting thing about this for us, though, is the structure of this building and the way that the structure actually holds up. This is some scale. You can see some people standing here and the way that the scale works. The fascinating thing for us about Sagrada Familia, so you should go see it and look at the basilica because it's absolutely beautiful. But then go to the museum in the basement because it actually shows how Sagrada Familia was designed. Because it turns out that when Gaudi was trying to design all those interlocking uh, support structures, he didn't have enough math to figure out if it would actually stand up or not. But he understood this physics principle that if you take string and deform it with gravity, that forms a weight-bearing arch. If you turn that upside down, it's a weight-bearing arch. And so what he did was design all the arch work. This is actually a similar cathedral, but the same design criteria, using strings and, and sandbags. And so you can see the way those deform into arches are the kind of arches that he designed for Sagrada Familia. Here it is from the side. But if you look at this, if you look up here at the top, you can actually see some people scale upside down. And so using the magic of slides, I'm going to flip this over. That's the cathedral. You can see the people standing here at the bottom on scale, and you can see the arches and the way all those arches form. That's exactly how he designed Sagrada Familia. Now, of course, we know that all that math works, but before we had the math to do that, he figured out a way to figure out all that weight bearing to be able to design that magnificent structure. So it's a great example of literally experimental architecture of how can we take architectures and experiment with them in interesting ways. And we see this in the software world Netflix and chaos engineering is a great example of pushing some envelope like that. All of the web services stuff from Amazon. LMAX, if you ever want to see a fascinating project uh, that really pushes things like transaction speed to the ultimate limit. So to summarize all these things, one of the interesting things to me about this is how a common thread runs through so many of these, which is this uh, desire for reuse both good and bad, because this is what NAB the Vasa was trying to reuse design. Same for Tacoma Neros was trying to reuse design and pushing it past where it could live. Trying to reuse old code in Null, trying to reuse everything in Ada. Again, old code in the Arian 5. Not enough reuse in pets.com and not enough infrastructure. Invest way too early in reuse for Webvan. Uh, reusing old toggles for Knight Capital. The San Francisco project was trying to reuse everything that's ever been created ever. Uh, the Chandler project was trying to build all these things for reuse before actually building anything that was useful and usable. And in, even in Sagrada Familia, we saw a, a reuse in, in design. But we see this in code as well. One of the things that we constantly keep trying to do is reuse code, but one of the great observations by John Cook is it's nowhere nearly as easy as we think it's going to be, and software use is typically way more like an organ transplant than it is snapping together Lego blocks. 
And so we, we still need to reuse things, but we need to reuse things very carefully in our world because it comes with, it's a classic trade-off. It comes with both a benefit and uh, cost. And so reuse stuff, but reuse stuff carefully and know what you're reusing and realize what it is that uh, you're taking advantage of and you're not incurring a huge cost. And my favorite quote about the past is not the Santayana one, but actually the William Faulkner quote, the past is never dead, it's not even past. And remember this quote, the next time you deal with a null pointer exception in your modern shiny programming language so that it can be backwards compatible to Fortran. <coughs> so thanks very much, I hope you enjoyed it.